I'm Larry Fedorik, and this is I Was Eight. It's season four of my personal journal podcast, and next week, Halloween, tricks, and treats. But now let's get on with this week's story. I Was Eight. Season four, chapter two. Movie magazines. During this series, I have often talked about the differences between the two sets of families, brought together by the marriage of Johnny and Sandra, mom v dad. Johnny and Sandra was how my dad's folks, siblings at Al, referred to the happy couple. Mom's side of the family called them Sandra and Johnny. That was always interesting to me. It's what all parents do instinctively, I suppose. You put your kid first. There were also many similarities, parallels, if you will. Johnny and Sandra both came from large Ukrainian farming families. Both sets of their parents came to Canada as young children. My great grandparents dropped off in the middle of the massive Canadian prairie inside a series of markers, wooden stakes that indicated their allotted land. Forging a life often with bare hands, strong will, and a faith. But no promise that any of this would actually work out. I learned of that much later, but when I was eight, what I noticed mainly were the differences. Even to get to the two different homesteads, we traveled in complete opposite directions from our town. It was like the beginning of the metaphor in explaining. Two opposing lifestyles. Driving to my mother's family homestead, one passed strongly built and sometimes even painted fences. Their farmyard was well maintained with carefully parked, up-to-date machinery, colorful sheds, granaries, and a big barn. Animals in their pens, and a huge, luscious garden of fruits and vegetables. The last couple miles of dirt road to Dad's family farm was overgrown with shrubbery and branches. Close your window, or you could lose an eye. Eventually, opening up to a farmyard cluttered with the skeletal remains of trucks, cars, and a big rusted whatever that thing was. Each building on the property, including the main house, seemed to lean about twelve degrees one way or the other. As if a complete collapse was imminent, tall weeds were everywhere, and it wasn't uncommon for a cow to suddenly stick its head through the open living room window. Shoo, shoo, cow! Needless to say, each family had different priorities when it came to running a farm. Of course, you know by now the differences in the Sunday family gatherings. Mom's side usually after church. Dad's side after the Sunday morning hangover subsided. Coincidentally, uh, about the same time of day, you know, noonish, all part of God's plan. Dad's side raucous, drinking, card games, yelling. Mom's side subdued, conversational, mindful, coffee. Interestingly, both sides were penitent in their own way, and on a typical Sunday, both sides often invoked the names of God and Jesus Christ, but for different reasons and in a different context. And the other commonality for both mom and dad, neither one's favorite thing was a visit with the in-laws. For eight-year-old Larry, there was good and bad on both sides. I mean, what choice did you have? You had to go, so you learned how to cope. On my mom's side, I was one of the older cousins. I am your leader. This is how we will have fun now. On Dad's side, I was the runt of the litter. There was nowhere to hide. I would not enter the tall weeds to pretend drive an old rusted Buick. Too dangerous. No sheds to hide in for fear it would crumble down upon me. Often my older cousins would call me from the herd and feast on my fear. So I learned it was best to just stay in the main house, 
set up in a corner that had a good line of sight to my mother and find something to pass the time. It was in that corner I made the glorious discovery of movie magazines. Movie screen, movie land, silver screen, motion picture, and of course, photo play. These were all brought to the party by my dad's sisters, Violet, Lily, Mary, and Alice. To be historically accurate, there was also an Eva, but I don't think she was as big a fan. Violet, Lily, Mary, and Alice compared the latest issues and then left them in the corner as they went on to play cards and have a few laughs with the men. The sisters were not exactly shrinking Violet's, Lily's, Mary's, or Alice's. They matched the men shot for shot, game for game, Jesus for Jesus. Remember how I used the word raucous there? Yeah. I was already a magazine aficionado, mad, cracked, sick, uh, comic books, which were almost like magazines, but there was nothing like these, nothing like movie magazines. Mother didn't even have to tell me. I could sense that reading these things was probably a Catholic sin, but I couldn't resist. The Hollywood Satans had taken over with their tales and pictures of modern-day Babylon. My inquiring mind had to know more. And hey, if I sinned, I could just go to confession again next week. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Since my last confession, I read photoplay five times. And, uh, hey, Father, how about that Mimi Van Doren? What about that, huh? That's interesting. Why do they call her Double D? Those aren't her initials. Do you think she's actually dating Elvis? Oh, my God. What's that, Father? To borrow my own line from a previous episode, heterosexuals don't ever have to come out unless you're Catholic. I'm interested in the opposite sex, at which point you're beaten with a wooden crucifix. And by the way, if we had all just used the word gender instead of sex over all these decades, I think there might be less of a panic about it. So I'm eight, a little early for my Catholic coming out, but I'll tell you, these movie magazines, women wore tight, tight pants with high heel shoes. Some women were only in their bathing suits. Can't not look at that. They often wore these suits poolside in their own enormous backyards. That's right, they had their own swimming pools. Dad, can we have a pool? I'll dig it myself. No, you just have to cement the hole. I'll fill it in with the hose. I said no. In winter, I can skate on it. No. No means no. Ah, uh, yes, the life of an eight-year-old. Yes means maybe. Maybe is a stall tactic in setting up a no. No means no. This is why nothing ever happens. All right, so back to the magazines. All the men wore beautiful suits and tuxedos. Everyone drove extravagant cars, except when they rode around in a limousine. All you had to do was be in a movie or sometimes just TV, and this would be your life. I began to notice that Violet, Lily, Mary, and Alice tried to look like the women in these magazines. They wore shiny, fancy dresses, impossible shoes, complicated hair, and lots of makeup. Their perfume arrived a half an hour before they did and stayed for two hours after they left. If any one of them hugged me, I still smelled like them even after a bath. I assumed their spouses appreciated the effort, but even at eight, I knew that Violet, Lily, Mary, and Alice were no Grace, Liz, Marilyn, or Doris. No offense, but this is why Grace, Liz, Marilyn, and Doris are taking a limousine back to their swimming pool, and Violet, Lily, Mary, and Alice are drinking shots at a card game on a farm in Saskatchewan in a building about to collapse and kill us all. I learned a lot from those movie magazines. Here's one. Marriage doesn't have to last forever. Not necessarily. In movie magazines, you could be married again 
three times. More, in certain cases. There was this thing called divorce. It was like the opposite of marriage. It was like calling a ball game because of rain. That seemed smart to me. Like it would take the pressure right off. Hey, sorry this isn't working out. I'm out of here. There were days when I wanted to divorce grade three. Oh, what? The Catholic Church doesn't allow divorce? Oh, big surprise. Well, the movies do. Mind you, our town had only one movie theater but two Catholic churches, so it's hard to tell who to believe. The other fascination for me in these magazines was that a lot of movie people seemed to drink this beverage called champagne. It seemed to be their go-to drink. It looked delicious, and I wanted some, but I found out it was a booze. It was one thing to get a sip from your dad's beer once in a while, but quite another to pop a magnum of champagne with the boys at the ball diamond during grade school recess. Hold on a second, hold on a second. What about ginger ale? Looks just like it. This one even calls itself the champagne of ginger ales. As a lifelong Pepsi guy, my parents were surprised when I began to ask for ginger ale. No one had any champagne glasses like they did in the movie magazines, but I did find something else. This old parfait glass in the back of the cupboard. So I washed that out and had my champagne in that. Elegant. Add a couple of Popeye candy cigarettes, and there I was, right in the pages of photoplay, hanging with Liz and Marilyn. You know, nothing like an eight-year-old emulating the consumption of alcohol and tobacco, while in reality consuming copious amounts of sugar. Eventually, Mom had to put a stop to my smoking and drinking. Those Popeye cigarettes, a hard habit to kick, I was up to a pack a day, plus an entire bottle of champagne. You know, instead of playing pretend driving in the family car, I switched. I would just sit in the back, booze and smokes, and limo conversations with Sophia. I also noted that the people in these magazines flew in airplanes a lot. Uh, one day I might fly in a plane... But in the meantime, I occasionally took my Canada Dry and Popeyes upstairs to my room, where I sat in a chair sideways by my window and gazed down as we floated over the countryside below on our way to a movie festival in France. More champagne, Larry? Yes, don't mind if I do. Thank you, Liz. See if Kirk would like some. Mom would come up and find me just sitting sideways by the window, sipping ginger ale and staring out the window like some psycho. Larry, what are you doing? Oh, thank you, stewardess. No, we're fine. Nothing at this time. I will ring if I need you. I didn't even really put two and two together to understand that these places like Hollywood, New York, or... Even France existed. It didn't matter. They, along with their glamorous residents, existed in the pages of these movie magazines. My twice-monthly escape from the world of a crumbling Saskatchewan farm overrun with packs of roving older cousin bullies. I wish I had understood the fascination of it, or kept the spirit of it all. Maybe I would have gone on to invent People magazine or lifestyles of the rich and famous, or entertainment tonight, or possibly even the internet. I didn't. You know, we started out today with some early 19th century immigrant dirt farmers. And the next thing you know, we were driving down Sunset Boulevard. Fantasy. Movies. The words often interchangeable. The great thing is that when you create one or the other, unlike real life, you are in charge of the story and of the way it turns out. And that's why I'd like to dedicate this episode to my first wife, Jane Fonda.
I Was Eight is a weekly storytelling podcast written, produced, and voiced by Larry Fedorik. A new episode every Thursday on all major platforms or Larry's I Was Eight YouTube channel. Tell a friend about his podcast and reach out to Larry Fedorik, that's F-E-D-O-R-U-K, at LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com.